the first epistle of Peter. A staggering book, a staggering document that if we are earnest with God, must stagger our hearts. The standard this man has set, the first epistle of Peter. There is no single document in the entire Bible. There is no single document in the entire Bible that reveals the mind of Christ. The thoughts of God. Concerning why he, as a sovereign God, allows trials, persecutions so great to continually come upon the lives of all who know him and love him on this earth. There's no single document in the entire Bible that reveals the heart of God the thoughts of God, the mind of Christ, concerning why he as a sovereign God allows great suffering and trials to come upon so many of his people continuously throughout their lives. Although Peter raises up different doctrines through this document. Doctrines of our faith that are staggering. If we read this letter carefully and prayerfully again and again, we become aware that every single topic, every single doctrine he addresses is for one reason, only to be the means of which linking us to give revelation, another aspect of sufferings, of Christian sufferings, that virtually nothing is addressed, that isn't linking us to give another facet to this doctrine of Christian sufferings, to give revelation of the heart of God concerning as to why He allows sufferings. What's the purpose? Why He is a sovereign God allows so much of the devil's hand to come upon His children that hurts that breaks them, that grinds them into the dust, but he as a sovereign God allows it. The greatest revelation of this letter from the heart of God, the greatest revelation is that there are only two reasons Christians suffer and if a Christian suffers trials and persecutions, it is for one of two reasons only that he faces these sufferings. It is for one of two reasons only that he or she will face sufferings as a Christian. Either because of their godliness as a result of their righteousness, Christ-likeness, or else as a result of their carnality and sin and folly while they profess to know Christ beginning in their home. Beginning in their home. There is one of two reasons, you as a child of God face deep persecution, sufferings, trials. Either your godliness or your sin. Either your Christ-likeness or your unchrist-likeness. I would like to ask you at the outset of this letter, as we go through this letter, to allow God, the Holy Ghost, to show you whether He commends you or condemns you because of 
the sufferings, the trials, the persecutions you face in your home, lady. Whether God tonight, through this letter, his word, commends you or condemns you, young man, Let God, and God only, through the Holy Ghost, through revelation to your heart tonight, in your desire to know his will and his mind and his thoughts concerning what you endure, let God speak as you listen carefully to the revelations and the different facets that are virtually the entire letter, if you listen carefully. You'll see that. He addresses this letter from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect. This word elect simply means chosen. Elect according to, according to the foreknowledge, the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto, unto obedience, unto obedience, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, hath wrought spiritual birth to us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, Reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. Kept by the power of God through faith. Unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now... Though now for a season, if need be, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ 
and of the glory that shall follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, as obedient children, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, in all manner of living, because it is written, it is written, be ye holy. Be ye holy. For I, I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Fervently. Being born again. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, wherefore laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, wherefore laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood that ye should offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders is allowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them that stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto even they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, 
which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conversation, your life, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, servants be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward, also to the cruel and unjust. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy. This is thankworthy. If a man, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. But even here unto are ye called, because Christ also hath suffered for us. But even here unto are ye called, because Christ also hath suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Whose own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were a sheep going astray, that are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Likewise, ye wives, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, by the life of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, Lord, whose daughters ye are, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and they're not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor, giving honor, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs, being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered, that your prayers be not hindered, Finally, be all of one mind. Be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that you are there unto call, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips 
that they speak no guile. Let them eschew evil and do good. Let them hate evil and do good. Let them seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better... If the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing, it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits which are in prison, which are in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was the preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffer us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excessive wine, revellings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excessive riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the spirit, but live according to, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Have fervent love among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though as if some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. 
On their part he is evil spoken of, but in your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evil doer. Or as a busy body in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. The elders... The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, for money, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise ye younger, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. All of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. He careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Sylvanus, by Sylvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. And so doth Marcus, my son, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity, of love. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, beloved, Christian sufferings are the main topic of this entire letter. And the pivotal verse 
upon which this letter revolves is chapter 3, verse 17. The axle upon which the wheel and every spoke, every single thing stated in this letter, just a spoke upon which the whole letter revolves, the axle upon which the whole letter revolves, chapter 3, verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. It is better if the will of God be so. It's lovely to see that it's God's will. Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their soul to Him in well doing. He says there the trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perisheth. He starts with these lovely words. Ye are in heaviness. If need be. Isn't that something? Do you know that sufferings are of the devil? Don't doubt that. He's a roaring lion. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, the same sufferings are accomplished, are upon all of your brethren. There's no one that escapes them. Do you think only communist China and Russia face persecutions? There can be a mental persecution, Madame Guillaume, far beyond a physical persecution. In Russia, to Rivzid Vorembrandt, Papa, oh beloved. If need be, if need be, don't doubt it, all sufferings, all trials, all persecutions are of the devil, sent by the devil to destroy you, allowed by God to make you. Now you must grasp that, or you won't understand anything in the school of God if you don't understand the basic lesson of the faith. Written from the first page to the last, virtually it all cries out, it comes out in the heart of God of why he allows things to come upon his children. Sent by the devil to destroy you, don't doubt that. Longing as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. But we are called to resist steadfast in the faith. And not think we're alone, but know that God allows it upon all his people. Allowed by God to make us, sent by the devil to destroy us, allowed by God to make us. How does he do that? Oh, the refining, the trials. Do you know more as accomplished brother, not on your knees in front of a meeting, but in the fires, to make you like Jesus? You have to come out in one moment to yield. You have to come out in one moment in sincerity to seek God. You have to be born again in one moment by the word of God, by faith, in the redemption blood of Christ who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. We have to put our faith, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Not of works, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted to him for righteousness. There has to be a moment you're declared righteous. You're born of God by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is where you're born again of the word of God. You're born again by your faith in God's word. What God tells us the blood of Christ accomplishes to those who put their faith in him. For he tastes the death for every man. Every man. I believe that. Amen. He will in no wise turn away anyone who comes to him through Christ Jesus. Oh, I believe that after the death he tasted for every man. It's not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Oh, he did taste death for every man. He is the propitiation for our sins, John says in 1 John 2 verse 1 and 2. He's the way to God for mercy for us as Christians if we sin. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I believe that. I believe it unashamedly. But now, beloved, once you're born again by the word of God, by faith and grace through the word of God, once you're born of God, you have to grow. And how do you grow? By the word of God as newborn babes. The only thing you can do, sir, lady, when you're born again is what your little baby did. He can't crawl. 
He's helpless. And so are you when you're born again. You can't even crawl. But oh, how you protect him. Do you think God the Father is any less with you? And the one thing he does know, he doesn't have to go to university to understand when he needs milk. <laughs> he just opens his mouth and, Wah! you know, the world knows. We don't have to go to university to know he needs milk. <laughs> He knows what he needs. And if you're born again, beloved, you will be in a state without the Word of God. You won't be able to survive. You'll be crying. How do I know I'm born again? They long for the witness of the Spirit. Brother, sister, don't wait for all emotional feelings. If the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God, the one thing about you, will you will have to have the Word. Or you'll be screaming for time. <laughs> Are you born again? How long ago... Did you spend time with God's Word? You grow by the Word of God, but you grow by much more than that. While you go through this book, because 80% Spurgeon says of this book was given by God as promises to take us through fires, sufferings, trials. And the Word of God does not become yours unless you're in these. And you learn that this isn't your source of doctrine any longer preacher when it becomes your source of survival then you can begin to preach because then you can comfort with a comfort wherewith you were comforted not before only what burns from your lips will burn into the hearts of people who hear you only what burns from this book into your heart will burn from your lips preacher and only what burns from your lips will burn into the hearts of those that hear you you will be dead doctrinally until you plunge, Spurgeon, Finney, Moody, Tory, name them. Until you're plunged into the depth of sufferings and trials, you are useless in God's hands. But wait until you cling to this book, not for your source of theology, but your source of survival. And watch how God begins to use you because every word, every word is yours. Burned in your heart. And it's no longer just doctrine. It's living. And it'll give life. It'll give life. Oh, beloved, this book is the source of faith. This book is the source of sanctifying us, of keeping us, of separating us. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Oh, the Word of God keeps you. It keeps you. And so we grow. But now we find ourselves suffering. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Do you know that's a promise? Oh, it's nice to get some promises, isn't it? All of you who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a staggering statement. And it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than evil for doing. Now, beloved, Jesus said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Oh, but find me a Christian who's persecuted for stupidity's sake. And I'll show you a Christian who the word blessed is not written across his life by God or man. He's cursed virtually. People will curse you, will become to hate your God, your religion, starting with your children, sir, if you're not Christ-like. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. But if what they say is true, sir, if they're accusations against you is true. You are unchristlike, carnal, sinful. Do you know right in your home, a man's enemies are the members of his own household if you become righteous when you're saved? Do you know why? Because your righteousness condemns the hearts of those in your home who still continue on in their unrighteousness. For the time past of our life may suffer us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, feastings and dancing, and abominable idolatries. But these things, when you turn from them, 
those, all who still remain in them that know you, their hearts are condemned. Beginning in the home. And so, in the home, the members of a man's house become his enemy. You don't have to go to Russia to be persecuted in communism when it was communism there. You just have to get saved and go home. And if you're godly, it starts there. The daughter will rise up against the mother. The mother will rise up against the daughter. The father against the son. If your godliness is the scriptural godliness, it's the will of God that you suffer. Do you know why? Their hearts are condemning them and God wants to win them through you. And you will. Eventually they'll come to glorify God through what they see. Oh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify and ultimately come to glorify your God which is in heaven through your life. Your life wins them, lady. If you just be Christ-like, be in submission, subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, oh, he's godless, yes. Don't leave him. Now that you've become godly, win him. He might be unrighteous. Just like there at the workplace, when you go to the work when you're saved, there's an unrighteous person you serve under, a manager or an owner of a company who treats you wrongly. Don't only be Christ-like to those who are just perfect, you know. Be so Christ-like to him that you win him. That you follow the example of Christ who when he was revived, revived not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And so you wives, how many wives come to Christ and their husbands are not godly? Do you know how you're going to win them? By being Christ-like. By being the message that he isn't going to go in here because he's against anything of right or truth. But without the word, you win him by your life as he beholds your chaste consultation coupled with fear. And you have an adorning of meekness, of holiness, Holiness without which no man shall see God. Oh, when God says, be ye holy, that's why you suffer. Because men's hearts condemn them. They wouldn't make you suffer just for a profession, but a life. Sir, you'll recover from the greatest preacher on the earth one day later. But you'll never recover from a life that you know, through and through, that once sinned with you, lived in sin, that turns from the sin that you still remain in. You can't. Your conscience won't allow you to. You writhe in agony. And you'll take it out on your son. You'll throw him out of the house. You'll disown him. Ostracize him. Persecute him. As God said, even in homes it would happen. The moment somebody finds vital reality. Vital reality with God. Now, beloved. Sufferings will not only win those who cause you to suffer, they will make you Christ-like. The refining fires, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Oh, beloved, if God doesn't allow you to go through sufferings, if he doesn't allow you to go through trials, what will you be at the appearing of Christ? All you have is the blood. All we do have is the blood for grace right to the end. But let me tell you, that must be a grief to God and everybody that was near you until you die. You couldn't win the world to God because you didn't get broken of self. And nothing will break you. Nothing will make you die in the dust. Where you come to the end of self. Where you... Oh. God allows like the, the refiner at the fire... There's the fire on the gold. And this God is in perfect control. Don't doubt it. The heat that he knows, the fires, the fires coming upon that gold, all the dross, all the rubbish. Just coming up as he purifies through fires. Nothing will purify that gold. And your faith, your trial of your faith is much more precious than that in God's eyes. The purifying of your life, the purifying of your life through all these... There's a moment that this God, this refiner, sitting with the fires, watching the purging, watching the purifying, will say, stop, don't doubt this, for a season, if need be. The unheaviness through manifold temptations, but the trial of your faith can just work godliness. 
is a moment God will say, Stop! For now. For now. He will never suffer you to be tested, to go through sufferings and trials above that you're able to bear. He is perfect. Don't ever believe God has lost control. Don't ever believe the devil has gained control. Then you're in troubles. Then your faith staggers and you become bitter. You have to believe. You have to just commit your soul, the keeping of your soul, as unto a faithful creator. He is faithful who created you, who created this world. He knows what he's doing. Beloved, he knows what he's doing when he allows fires to come in you. The only time you're in trouble is when you take your eyes off Jesus, like Peter, and you begin to sink. And oh, in mercy, he has to... Oh, why did you doubt? Now he has the clay in the potter's hand and just marred because you didn't yield. You started to try to fight for yourself rights. Fight back. Defend. Oh, instead of Christ-likeness coming through the fires, ugliness comes. Bitterness. Anger against God and man. Oh, you just devoured of what God could have done for you you stand up for yourself and defend and defend and defend and defend and defend oh dearly beloved for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves likewise with the same mind for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that's a staggering verse and you've got to go to many 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 documents and commentaries to find anybody willing to be brave enough to even discuss what that means. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise. Do you know what that word arm yourselves means? It's in the same, the same Greek word as you will find in Ephesians 6 from verse 10 onwards. Put on the whole armor of God. You need it. You wrestle not against flesh and blood when people persecute you. Don't you know that it's the devil using them? We race against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have taken to you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then he comes under the armor of God to protect ourselves from all the devil will do to try and destroy us. And there's the wonderful thing, faith, through which you will absolutely quench all the fiery darts of them. There's such amazing victory in Christ through armor that God gives us. But this armor, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Take this armor for yourselves now through what sufferings are going to come upon you. With the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. There's something here about Romans 6. Reckoning yourself dead indeed unto sin. There's something about the work of the cross that Christ did. There has to come not a dead doctrine by saying, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Oh, you can say that so dead you could put people to sleep. But when it's a testimony, I am crucified with Christ. When there's a moment, sir, you die. You have a personal Calvary. Andrew Murray, the greatest preacher South Africa ever had in its history, and one of the most loved preachers in the history of the world said, unless there comes a moment in every Christian's life where they have a personal Calvary, where they die to self, where they absolutely surrender and allow God to fill them with the Holy Spirit, to control them, that's all it means. Unless a child of God comes to a place where he has a personal Calvary, he becomes a grief to God and man. Beginning in his home, Andrew Murray says. You can be saved and eventually, unless you come to a place of absolute surrender, unless you come, child of God, to a place where you reckon yourself, to, where you, you face a personal Calvary, where you are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ takes over. God takes control. He lives his life through me. He who was able to be reviled and reviled not again. 
is living it through me. That's the only moment you'll be able to revile and not revile again, sir. That's the only moment you'll be able to bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which will spitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. Beloved, there has to be a moment as George Mueller said when George Mueller died to his own opinion. And then you find the ability to not react unchristlikely, but to react with the fruit of the Holy Spirit in all circumstances, no matter how trying those circumstances. Love suffereth long and is kind. Are you? Have you ever, when you've suffered long, been kind? Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Do you? When? If you're against the doctrine, for God's sake, if it doesn't work in your life, try it. You might find you're wrong in your doctrine, sir. If you're fine, if you're victorious, if you've real Christ, if you're not a failure and carnal and sufferings come upon you through your pride and does self-defense, it's just one big war to defend yourself when anybody touches you or wrongs you, beginning in the home. Maybe you need to listen to Andrew Murray, to Hudson Taylor, to John Wesley, to William Booth, how many of the men that shook this world testify openly they had to come a moment of personal Calvary and then God used them? And you? To, this, to be used in your own home, to win your own husband? to be used there at the workplace, to win those who will persecute you, to be able to truly love your enemies is when Christ loves them through you, sir. Not your own love. Your own love's not good enough. It has to be the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. There's something about God's fruit that's only spontaneously seen in all circumstances when there's an absolute surrender. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves, take this death. By faith, reckon yourself dead, not only for salvation. Doctrine can be deadly if you put it beyond what's expected of you when it comes to a personal covering. There are two ways of winning an argument as a Christian. The carnal Christian attempts to win the argument by defending himself and his rights, always. The Christ-like Christian wins his argument by silence. The carnal Christian wins his argument but loses the soul, always. The Christ-like Christian wins the soul by his ability to remain silent. What are you? Even if you're a preacher, the one who wins the argument at all costs, Oh, you wipe the floor with him, do you, sir? Tell me anyone you ever argued with you won. You didn't win, you lost. Because you're carnal. You defend everything, not only your doctrine, with your life. Did anybody touch anything? In the workplace, the unjust, cruel employer is one to Christ. by the Christ-like submissiveness and silence of those he undermines and underscores. That's how I won the man I worked for, who owned the company I worked for, when he shouted and screamed and smashed his fist out and cursed me, and I kept silent. And I sensed love in these eyes. He crumbled. How do you win a man, sir? I sat with the leading charismatic preacher in our country. And there he was angry with this poor man for not preaching that you've got to have tongues and everything else in the world. And he just let me have it. Whoa, did he put me to the other side of the table in a room full of people while he just went, pow, wiping me. And you know what God said to me? There's this man who's known right throughout our nation. Just carried on. 
God said to me, be still, Keith. Just be quiet. And you know, at some point, that man, as he saw the love in my eyes and the ability that I had just to stay silent, to stay silent, no matter what he was saying, he lost the argument. You know what he did? He spoke softer and softer until my silence condemned him. And he bowed his head and he sobbed like a baby. How do you win the argument, sir? By losing the soul? By losing the soul? Oh, in every unjust situation in life, we are called to be in subjection. In our homes, at our workplace, to our enemies. Someone smites you with the right cheek, turn the other. There just has to be something of nothing of a self-defense left. Like Christ, our example. But that's not possible unless you have a personal Calvary. We conquer this world, sir, by refusing to fight back, by loving our enemies, by doing good to them that hate us. <sighs> oh, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. There has to be some moment that that happens not a continual just trying and trying, you know, to live a little bit more. There has to be a moment when Christ takes the hold of absolute surrender. And from that moment, the next verse says, and be ready, always, to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. They start to ask the reason. They want to know what, what is this you have. If Christ is sanctified in your heart, He's allowed to have his way, reigning in the heart. Reigning in the heart. Not just dwelling in the heart. Doctrinally, you may differ from me, sir. Well, I'm so sorry. But just for a moment, tell me. Put your doctrine down for a moment. Is Christ living in your heart? Has he ever reigned, sir? I mean reigned. Or do you still reign? Have you never had a personal Calvary, George Mueller? That's why the world never heard of you, or did you? And the whole Christian world, age upon age, will remember you for what God did through you. Sir. Sir. I have one deep burning desire that I may be like Jesus to this I fervently aspire that I may be like Jesus. I want my heart is thrown to be so that a watching world may see his likeness shining forth through me. I want to be like Jesus. To all of you, whose lives are suffering because of unchristless, unchristlikeness, unsubmissive spirits. How many of you need to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God? That he may exalt you in due time. How many of you need today to come to absolute surrender?